also coming to my meeting tonight. Um, we have a golden guest board member Peter on Zoom to uh, be uh, considered for us. We had a request from when we're fairly going to. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Um, I have a request and I'd like to go around the table and see who we are and who's counting up and down to the So, um, here. Uh, Carrie Bristow, Woodstock, Woodstock, and Ernesto Fernandez, Woodstock. Adam Emily from Reading. Jan Nosky, Woodstock. Joe Rubin from Plymouth. <laughs> okay, I think I've confused you all. We're just asking for the board members to introduce themselves. <laughs> Good evening, all. This is Anna representing Reading. Dan Carl representing Killington. All right, thank you all. Um, we're going to start with a public comment time, which is for any comments or questions not related to the WHS MS presentation tonight? If you are using Zoom, we would appreciate that you would put it in the chat and then we will read your question um, as they uh, come in. Yes. Back when you all started this, why didn't you ever ask the local contractors to come in and give their approval or appreciation of? of how it builds things, either your phones, your contractors, your electricians, your your masons, or whatever, instead of just hiring another outside engineer to do something. I mean, we're all taxpayers. We we built this school together. You know, they know more about the structural building than any architect will ever know. And you've never had a site engineer come in and do drilling or testing of this building. Structurally, this building is fine. There's a few problems, but the maintenance of this whole building. It's just gone downhill. That's a question. Back, back in when Steve Charlton was joining that, you cut his budget just so you could give the, the school principal a bigger grade. So always cut maintenance. That's you always cut maintenance. We are not taking that question until the building presentation. Oh, why didn't you fire the local why the yard yard work? Public comment. Right now, it's supposed to be about anything but the new building. Then we're going to have new buildings. So, why didn't you ask the local people, taxpayers that work here, please, the blue collar laborers, to help put input into maybe renovation? And that's relative to the new build, which is we have a public comment period for that after the presentation. Right now, public comment is for anything that does not have to do with your building or grounds. No, public comment is you haven't done your maintenance. I have a question. Yes. Jim Half. Uh, just for the record to make it straight, Ms. McFenn, you were not here my last few my, uh, prior to my um, last year of being on the board. I really don't appreciate you putting in a newspaper that um, there was only work done on the study for um, energy saving. You were not here when I was up on the roof with JCI. You were not here when I went through with the windows. You were not here when we went through all the other work. 
when I did ask you a question about the policy of going forward for a bid, you said you could not answer the question because you were not here and you did not know what the rules were or the policy at the time. But you were sure fast enough to pull the trigger to say that a board member that was on this board for 15 years spent many hours working on a deal with JCI to come out and say that Jim Happ is a liar. I'd just like to go on the record to say you were not here, so you're not a liar, but you shouldn't have represented yourself on something you did not know. I don't need a response back. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, Alyssa's other public comment. Is there anyone? Yes. I, um, I'm just going to read this right off. I'm terrible. Sorry. Sorry. No, that's fine. You're fine. Um, my name is Katie Stiles, and I'm the parent to a current KEF preschooler attending through the Act 166 program. My child has loved his time at KEF, and back in March, I sent an email to the MDSU school board requesting the district to consider allowing students who live out of district to attend the school via tuition beyond the Act 166 program. I attended the school board meeting in person on April 1st to formally put in my request to pay tuition for my son to attend KES. At that meeting, I was told the matter would be discussed further by the board and that they would be in touch. Over the next 61 days, I followed up regularly via email for any more information about my request. Emails were consistently left unanswered until recently when I sent the following. Following up on this again, please let me know if I should be directing my inquiry somewhere else. As the year end quickly approaches, we would like to be able to prepare our son for the upcoming school year and lock down our plan as a family. He is five, and if he needs to say goodbye to his friends and teachers, I would like him to do so feeling empowered and prepared. I'm appreciative of all you do, and I understand there are... Sorry, I can't hear her. Please. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm appreciative of all you do, and I understand there are multiple layers to our inquiry. We would really appreciate any information you could provide. And then the response I got to that was... Good afternoon, Katie. Please forgive the delay in answering your emails. At this time, we cannot accept out-of-district students as tuition students until grade nine. I understand that is not the answer you were hoping for, but it is complicated. Thank you for your patience and hope that your son makes a smooth transition. My follow-up inquiry for more information and an in-person meeting about how this determination was reached was answered with an email telling me the board would be in touch with more information. I have yet to receive that information. I understand the request of a single person falls to the bottom of the list when you're looking at the future and well-being of an entire middle and high school student body population. But given that the state of Vermont's Department of Education has no formal policy on tuition in, rather leaving them to district choice, and given that this current district is actively pursuing financing for a very large project and for ways to attract more students when the overall student population is in a decline, I am again formally requesting an explanation of this decision and how it was reached. As the budget conversation swiftly follows this agenda item for open comment, I wanted to share our experience as a family. Thank you, Ping. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yes. My name is Helen, and <laughs> someone, I still haven't received my documentation that I requested three months or four months ago for what the policy is as far as sporting events and having security here. And number two is how come the state was in here a couple of years ago and I have all the information now and I'm going to share it as many people as I can that it was only going to cost $12 million to do all the renovations that were needed to this building to bring it back up to par. Okay, again, Kelly, we, we before you came in, we're taking all um, public comment related to the building and the projects after the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Is it typical that no one responds to the questions asked? It, it, I mean, what's the purpose of these meetings if our questions aren't being addressed? Is it happening at the end? Can you just let me know how that works. We listen to what's being said, and if we feel appropriate to follow up, we follow up individually, individually, or we discuss it further as a board work when we have time to take up those matters. Right, but that's what we're here for right now. It's called the input. Yeah. All right, at this time, then we are going to move into the 
uh, WUHS MS options presentation. I'll have them sitting here to introduce themselves and who they represent, and then they will be uh, presenting. And then the board will have time to talk and ask questions um, probably after your presentation, preferably. And then there will be public comment that will be taken as well. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Marty Spaulding. I'm the co-owner of PCI Capital Project Consulting, um, where the, uh, we've been retained by the school district to act as the owner's representative to um, uh, help them through their construction project. We were retained shortly prior to um, the March bond vote, uh, and now we're working with the school district through their uh, this um, planning process to determine the next steps to uh, uh, get to a, a, a future bond vote. Um, based on you know what decision comes out of uh, this this meeting tonight and at the next board meeting, so following the March bond vote, the school district put out a, a survey to the community members to get a sense of what the community members were uh, looking for um, around you know why the bond might have failed. Uh, one of the um, takeaways was that they were looking for more options to be considered. So in 2017, an extensive study was done by the architect, which is um, Lee Sherwood from uh, Laval Brenzinger. Uh, I believe Lee is online with us. Um, so that study looked at uh, options to include renovations as well as a, a few conceptual designs. Um, obviously, construction costs and lots of factors have changed since 2017. So um, part of our strategic strategic planning process was to update some of those op options to today's current pricing. Um, so I'm going to also introduce this as Paul Stafford. Uh, he's been the lead on the project. Paul's going to walk us through um, the presentation we have here. Uh, this is uh, Kurt Mazer. Kurt is from PC Construction, which is different from PCI Construction. They're the construction project management firm that has been hired to oversee the ultimate uh, project. So Kurt did uh, the, the cost estimating for the construction side of, of, of these four options that we're going to present to you tonight. Uh, and then we did the, the soft cost of uh, um, construction cost estimates for, for those options. So let me share my screen. Bear with me. There we go. You see that up there, all right? Okay. Well, you go ahead, Paul, and talk through the oops, the options that we're focusing on. I will also mention, sorry, that there's a one-page handout that goes. Uh, through the four options that we're exploring is a high level cost estimate, as well as a, a breakdown for the duration of the construction uh, until students would potentially be moving into those new phases. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Paul Stafford. I'm the project manager for uh, Mountain Views, Woodstock High School and Middle School. Uh, what we did as a um, committee shortly after the, the bond vote was met on site and toured this facility. Uh, we saw lots of major issues uh, to the point where a band-aid approach will not fix this facility. So and you know it's a it's a milestone type of uh, project for this community, not uh, for this school district. So we all collectively, including many of the board members here, uh, developed a strategy to look at basically three options. Um, looking at renovating the existing uh, facility. Option two was to look at a hybrid option of taking just the high school and putting it somewhere on site and utilizing the middle school and high school during construction similar to option three. Option three, which is the bond vote, uh, 
looking at what the cost would be a year from now uh, to construct that facility and then look at absolutely everything that we could strip it from without losing programmatic spaces. So those are the, the three options. There's really four when you when you factor in the fact that we're looking at a 3A and a 3B, the, the bond vote. Okay, so the first option we looked at was option one, which is the existing building. Now this building, can we go to the next slide? This building has to stay um, operational during construction. So there's several aspects of this, this project that um, some of which was covered in the original master plan. I, I think there were six phases identified in the original master plan. PC construction is, it is proposing seven phases over a four and a half year period to renovate this facility in fact. Okay, go back. So that those were the phases on the screen before. The, 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 you'll be shocked at the number. The construction estimate for renovating the existing building as is without touching the athletic facilities or doing any uh, geothermal is 82.3 million. Much of that has to do with the construction duration and the cost to provide temporary swing classrooms during construction, as well as construction escalation costs beyond a typical two-year window. Um, renovated square feet in total is 130,000 square feet. That equates to 779. I think on past presentations, um, that is in line with other school um, projects throughout the state. The design duration of this building is, is the um, renovation is not designed right now. So there would be a year and a half of architectural design that would be required. And then I talked about the four and a half year period. So you're looking at a completion date of August, September 2030, if you were to approach this. In order to compare it to the bond vote, um, the committee suggested looking at adding geothermal <clears throat> and the athletic fields to the renovation. So that added an, approximately another $5 million of construction. Um, the duration is the same, the completion date is the same. And then the dollars per square foot obviously went up because of it to 816 a square foot. All right. Just a little additional detail on the first option. Without the geothermal, it also doesn't uh, and, and assume that you'd be adding cooling to the building. So no cooling whatsoever. All right. Whereas option B, 1B would have cooling. All right. So option two, we actually looked at two options for option two. Uh, one of which, again, always keeps a middle school and high school intact during construction. But one option that was uh, suggested was to connect a new high school to the existing middle school. Um, and then eventually tear down the high school. That option was not um, considered to be brought in front of, of the full school board uh, for many reasons. We can go into that more, but today we are presenting the freestanding high school and keeping the existing middle school. And I should add the renovation to the um, existing school as an option one, that is a full stripped down option. That is complete replacement of all the doors and windows, complete replacement of the roof and the building envelope to some degree upgrades to current standards, um, structural uh, changes um, for structural deficiencies in the gymnasium. This option, option two for the middle school only addresses finishes and some minor uh, mechanical upgrades for the middle school. Um, so again, the costs are still high. The construction estimate is at 76 million for with a total of 70,000 square foot of renovation, minor renovation in the middle school, and 90,000 square foot new high school as depicted in this image. You can slightly see in this image a ghosted footprint for a future middle school yet to be determined in this option 
and not priced in this option. Total dollars per square foot is lower. So it's it's uh, $575 a square foot. Design duration is again a year, uh, year and a half because right now it's as far as this bubble direct diagram. Then um, the construction duration would be two phases. For first two years for construction and one year for demolition of the existing. So it's a little bit confusing to start. It's a total of three years, but the demolition duration is one year of that too. Also, because of the fact that it becomes a campus-like environment, there are some additional uh, staffing increases that would have to happen with this option, as well as some one-time costs uh, to support both facilities and um, annual operating cost loss is a, about $400,000 per year to run two, two buildings on one campus. So, yeah. Now, option three is, is the most simple to understand. That's the bond vote. The only difference is we included that it's starting in 2026 instead of 2025. That put a 5% construction and ex escalation on the number. Uh, so we're at, we were at 90 million. We're now at 94.9 million. So um, now we're over 100 million. We're at 105 million for a potential bond vote. Uh, the design duration is the project's in uh, design development, which means nearly uh, complete for construction documents. So the remainder 10 month period would be to complete those construction documents. There were some cuts made in this uh, option three, even for the bond vote, which was not reflected in the original design documents. Those would have to be incorporated into the construction documents. Uh, construction duration is still two years. So that puts us in July, August of 2027. There is also included in that time frame a one year demolition duration, which is actually outside of the construction duration. That's so it's a total of three years. Option 3B is uh, the committee's approach to strip as much of the uh, uh, bond vote option uh, to bare bones. So you'll see this lifting in uh, the lower right of the screen of what I, items are considered at this point. And again, none of this is, is has been cut yet. These are all just considerations. Uh, if you recall from the bond vote, there was a half a wing that was cut off of the building. It was the art languages wing. This um, approach would take the remainder of the, that wing. Uh, again, there's some programmatic elements associated with that, which we'll go into in a little bit. The office wing also is eliminated to one story. That would mean counseling would go on the first floor and the Mountain View's um, administrative offices would, would remain in their current facility. And there is an elimination of a second floor conference and lounge area of 400,000. We have considered uh, going to a flat roof building throughout at 200,000, uh, reduction of stage lighting. Uh, again, we, the auditorium would still have lighting. There just was some lighting remaining still on the construction budget, which we took about half of that out again. And then there is about a, a million dollars of targeted value engineering items yet to be determined, but we would, PCI would work closely with PC construction to make that happen if we were going that route. Total reduction of 4.4 million. Total reduction in square feet from uh, 158 to 84 uh, to 150,000 square feet. That puts us at a uh, cost of construction uh, roughly about the same as bond vote of $669 per square foot. Uh, I should add too in the salt costs. But if you look at the soft cost original construction budget, it was a bit high, a bit lower than this number. Um, we added some additional contingencies to that soft cost number. 
All right, so option one, again, we looked at both the pros and cons of the for it. Again, this is the existing building uh, option. So the pros to that is obviously little impact to surrounding site, including athletic fields, because you can use those still, except for one, which would be a lay down area, even if we were to do the existing building renovations. It preserves the legacy of the building. Uh, it also potentially reduces the environmental impact of the demolition for the versus uh, demoing the entire building. I, uh, the cons are the construction phasing costs is costly, mostly in part of the four and a half year uh, duration. <clears throat> Temporary classrooms are costly. Right now, this budget shows a $10.6 million um, figure for both for provision of temporary classrooms. And I should add that's more eight to 10 of those flex classroom spaces when we're renovating the building as phases. <clears throat> Hidden problems may be costly uh, due to uh, change orders. We The only thing we can tie into construction documents is what can be seen. So any uh, existing conditions on the site. We're utilizing plumbing systems that were put in in 1958 or 1968, which I hope we're not uh, with this renovation. But if we did, it's going to uh, cause change orders. Uh, it's a longer disruption to students over a longer period of time. You basically have one senior class that will not have an experience. Does not meet current goals for modern teaching and learning. Again, this renovation would maintain all the spaces as they are, just renovate the mechanical, plumbing, and electrical. Probably change around a little bit of spaces, but not much. Um, difficult to attract and retain new students with an existing facility. It does not capture the natural views of the surrounding mountains due to its original orientation, and it will require complete replacement in a shorter period over a new building. Now, let me talk a little bit about that. So uh, a new building right now, you're probably going to get 40 to 50 years out of it, of a life cycle cost. <laughs> the existing building, you will get a 40 to 50 year old um, turnaround on new mechanical, new electrical. What you're not going to get a 50 year turnaround on is the existing building in total. You know, we'll put on a 30 or 40 year old roof, you know, new roof that will last 30 or 40 years. We'll reset the window clock, you know, putting in all new windows and doors. Finishes will be nice, um, but again, it's not a new building. All right, option two. Again, this is for the, uh, the hybrid building. Uh, so it's just the high school on the football fields right now. The pros are it's a phase approach. We'll definitely save dollars. It's a minimal impact to current school operation because it's remote to the existing campus. It orients the building correctly, less disruption to existing campus, separate middle school and high school experience, which is nice, allows for uh, uh, drawing new students to the high school. Phased approach with a smaller three story building. Um, and the middle school would allow for greater enrollment potentially in the future to 800 plus. Or conversely, if the enrollment is smaller, we can build a smaller middle school. Um, longer repayment term, which means lower in tax in impact. Those are all pros for option two. Uh, the cons are obviously the existing football field uh, will require replacement. Duplication of the cafeteria is going to have to happen, which means more staff and operating costs. Some phasing and project disruption, increasing costs. More difficult to recruit and retain new students due to the middle school. And redesign will take more time and money. And uh, it could go to bond in March 2025. What I mean by that is we would recommend that if you pick this option that you did like you did similarly for the uh, bond vote and authorize design 
uh, so that we could have accurate numbers in March 2025. Option three and three B. Again, option three is the existing bond though. So the pros are the Vermont Agency of Education has already approved this design. That will potentially help in uh, state funding if and when it becomes an available, and that's a huge if. Uh, probably, to be honest with you, you you're not going to get any additional funding uh, in the foreseeable future. Of that. I'm sorry to say that it's just true. Design development is um, complete, and stakeholders, including community and staff, approve of this direction. A lot of programming went into this building, a lot of time spent on, on a good design. Design utilities uh, use utilize the latest technology, including ge geothermal, solar, uh, um, very energy efficient mechanical systems. Uh, design orientation capitalizes the mountain noodles and the surrounding like land. Less disruption on existing campus operation because of its remoteness. And it could be a potential September bond vote. The, uh, the cons are, you know, design relies on complete replacement of the middle school and high school. It's harder to phase. The existing football field, again, would re require replacement. And obviously, the voters have spoken. So additional cuts may help make this pass, but uh, no, that's all I'll say on that. Option 3B is uh, the pros or the design development is complete. Stakeholders, including community and staff, have already approved this direction. It's design utilizes the latest if no technology. Design orientation is the same. Less disruption to existing campus operation. But to, and the potential September bond bill still applies. We've confirmed that with the architect that if this option 3B was selected, it still is a 10 month uh, duration uh, for completion of design. The cons are, again, it relies on the complete replacement, football fields impact, programmatic implications to reduce the art wing may impact the language and art programs, including re recruitment to the new middle school and high school. And then the roof line changes may be a minor thing to some of you as an uh, architect, you know, it could potentially be a big deal. Um, to be honest with you, it was about a $500,000 savings, but because of adding additional plumbing lines to drain that flat roof, you're eating into those potential savings. All right, next steps. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and this is just kind of uh, zooming out, you know, why are we having this tonight? Um, you know, the, um, uh, in terms of the, the timing, you can see here on the slide, you know, we're at uh, June 3rd tonight. We need to get the information and the pricing. This was the big development for this evening. And then in two weeks, uh, we're looking at a special board meeting. We typically meet once a month, but the board has committee meetings. Um, you know, uh, in the in the in the two weeks between uh, the board meetings, so we'll repurpose that uh, for the uh, the potential to be able to uh, make a decision on one of these options and uh, potentially a, a timing for a bond vote. And in that window between tomorrow and, and that um, uh, that uh, that meeting in two weeks, uh, we're looking to our board members to speak with members of the community. We'll certainly hear uh, probably a number of opinions this evening and um, you'll come back as some more and more members to be able to engage in the discussion and, and potentially make a decision. Now, uh, you see this um, you know, possible special election bond vote in September. That's something you know, that is, as, like, as Paul went through the presentation, it's really the earliest that you know, the board can really make a decision to take something back to the voters. So we're kind of flagging that. That, that doesn't mean that this board is, is committed to taking something vote in September or you know in in uh, March of next year for that matter we need to look at the information that's been uh, provided and, and make decisions as board. that's the uh that's the timeline for me. just want to add a couple of other things too the first and foremost there's four options here we could have 40 options you know there's a lot of um 
possible option options out there. Uh, so, and as we're going through this process, PCI has really tried to keep the all the options out, flowing out of the the committee and community having some sidebar conversations. So, even though we're presenting these four options, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. So um, we welcome all any or all options on the table. Second thing is, is this committee did not select an option. So that's up to the school board and this community. So don't think that we already have a preconceived notion of what we want to do. All options are good options at this point. Yep. At this time, the board has the opportunity to ask uh, questions and make comments uh, in order to hear everyone's thoughts and questions tonight during board questions and public comment. We um, will be timing for three minutes of speech with a, a warning at the two minute 30 second mark to let you know that uh, you need to wrap it up. Uh, let's try to keep repetition of questions and comments down. We don't need to hear the same comment over and over again. Once is enough. Each person has one question they can ask and won't be called on again until everyone else has had a first question. Um, when we get to public comment, please state your name and your town. And those who are on Zoom, we ask that you put your question in um, so that we can read your question out loud and they'll be read in the order um, in which they are received. I do want to remind everyone that this is a civil meeting. It's a civil board meeting. We expect people to state their opinions. We welcome that, but we would appreciate if you would keep it civil tonight. Thank you. Elliot. Yeah, Elliot Rubin from Plymouth. I just have a question is, are there any scenarios of renovations that are less expensive than what was outlined? That are entertained that are, you know, tens of millions of dollars will ask for. The, the goal was to look at comparing the renovation option to for the building to hopefully last as long as the as the new build option for the purpose of assuming that you're going to bond for that over like a 30 year term. So you need the, those upgrades to, to last that long. If, if you looked at other options, Probably you wouldn't actually go to bond for that. You'd actually build a, a, a capital plan into your general fund operating cost. Anybody else from the board? Um, so under option two, with the um, renovations that you would do to the middle school, how long do you think the middle school could keep going? I think you would have to continue to add some funds to your general fund budget to keep that building operational through that period of time. And then kind of depending on how long, how much money you, you know, add into your operating costs will determine, you know, depend on how long that, that building uh, long remains long in use. Like for, you know, a roof is an example. You just can't continue. You can't keep pushing that uh, down the line. At some point in time, you know, depending on the existing condition of the roof, you need to put money funds into your general fund budget to replace that. I would say all the mechanical systems for the new high school. We're thinking about a freestanding plant that would run the middle school because the, the uh, mechanical. Uh, system is in the 1958 building for the middle school right now. So um, we would have to address that if we took down the, the high school. Um, that will probably buy you at least 15 years, probably longer, before you have to really do a complete renovation or replacement of the middle school. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in option 2B, we, we added in that central heating plant addition. So that that money is is priced in there to to do that. But if, to answer your question too, that may be a consideration too, is to scale back on the plumbing, mechanical, electrical in the renovation. If we had to bring down costs, uh, I, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of really antiquated systems in this building now. And one of the reasons why we should point out one of the reasons why we're 
really only addressing like the interior finishes of the middle school has to do with the level of construction that you do to a facility that triggers you to bring that facility up to current code. Like the level that we're, we're proposing in the high school is to bring that in the renovation option is to bring the building up to up to current code. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, when replacing a roof, typically you also want to look at adding insulation to that roof in order to meet the energy code for the building. Um, sometimes when adding that insulation, you also have to uh, look at the um, you know the st structural uh, co requirements, and sometimes that because you're adding more weight to the insulation, then you have to add more roof leaders, which are drains to reduce the weight on the roof. So that upgrade and and. Uh, you know, incorporates the assumption that you're bringing everything up to that current code where the middle school does the middle school option in the hybrid option doesn't assume that you're going to bring those, you know, the systems up to that current requirements. Which, uh, which design benefits the students that would be attending that the most with the variation in sizes? Separate location in the open line, which uh, part of the whole construction process and as developed, which one is best suited for the kids' education? Well, I would say the complete new build would provide the most program upgrades to the uh, you know student um, experience. Definitely, the the hybrid option uh, um, would assume bringing those those same pro programmatic upgrades to the to the high school, but just but not the middle school. Thank you. Um, I have a question. In option three B, which is the existing bond design but further scaled back, um, how many students would that building be designed for under that configuration? Um, I don't know the total number of students, but I know it's it's not induced from what was brought. To bond, uh, there's a few programs that are cut out of that um, option. Um, one of which is like the administration would remain in the current central office building, so that's not really a reduction of of student capacity. Um, and there's a couple of other. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. So unfortunately, because we're trying yeah. to see the impact, it would mean a reduction of a wellness classroom. Um, the community kitchen, uh, the core room would move into the horse room, would move into the green room, the changing for theater. Um, we would have uh, smaller senior spaces, uh, we'd have a place for balcony to get out of, a senior space. We wouldn't have a faculty uh, conference room. And the world languages, we were able to move, pivot the art rooms into the um, that world language section, but the world language classrooms would not have external windows. They would have light from skylights. So those were the impacts of losing that section of the building and reducing the other spaces. We, uh, rather than having counseling on that first floor, uh, Lee and I discussed having counseling right in the center of the building so we have greater student access. So the only classroom reduction would be a wellness classroom or two wellness classrooms a chorus room and community kitchen space. Would you please um, speak to why um, option uh, 1A and 1B and 2B all include the renovation of baseball and athletic facilities while um, the new construction option does not include any reference to fields and athletic facilities. Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, yeah, so so the renovations for the baseball and other athletic facilities are built into option 3A and 3B as, as part of the uh, the overall plan that was included with the bond book initially. So it's it's mostly to get the other options apples to apples with that level of athletic finish. Thank you. It, that brings up a good point, though, with the option one 
uh, the existing buildings. There's a very there's a much larger construction contingency in these cost estimates. Um, upwards of I think it's 10 million, isn't it? 10% of the total. So um, so 82 million, eight, 8.2 million dollar contingency in options one A and one B. Anna has her hand up. Thanks for recognizing my hand. Um, I just wanted to bring this up as I'm looking. I took some screenshots and I've been able to swipe around and look more at the information. Um, I was really hopeful at the hybrid option as, as we started talking about it at a school board level. Um, I was also excited about the cost per square foot. And then I realized that it's $91 million going on $92 million, which when you compare it to either of the new build options is only a difference of like nine to $14 million. And it's only replacing one building. And as we're hearing, you know, we're replacing the new high school, but then we wouldn't get a, a new middle school, which is then we're looking at having to replace a whole nother building in maybe 10, 12 years and all of the maintenance fees that goes along with it. As a representative of our taxpayers, this to me is not an efficient and financially sound decision. Um, it seems crazy to spend nearly the same amount replacing a single building as opposed to replacing both of the buildings. And so I just wanted to bring that to, to everybody's attention that um, while the square footage dollars looks great, and again, we were really excited about the hybrid option, and this is, of course, to no fault of the designers and the builders, but this cost really is not a smart financial decision for our taxpayers. Thank you. Ian, Carl has her hand up. Hi there. Um, thanks for this. Can you just say a little bit more about what goes into the soft costs? I noticed that for the um, option three, the soft costs were quite a bit lower than the other soft cost options. So I just wanted to understand what goes into that. Um, yep, I, I can speak to that. So we do have um, some additional slides uh, showing the soft cost for each of the options. Um, a couple of the different drivers in option one. Two. Just bear with us here. No, sorry. I'm not trying to get rid of that. So a couple of the drivers in the soft cost have to do with the the length of the project, like because the project is going to be not the renovation option is is going to be phased over four and a half years. That obviously drives a, a lot of soft costs as well. Um, and as Paul just mentioned, we also have a higher contingency in this option, a 10% contingency, because dealing with a renovation of all the unknown factors, um, you know, having a appropriate contingency is um, important and no design has gone into this whatsoever. So um, no, nobody's really done that level of evaluation of the existing systems to, you know, put, put a hard number, you know, most of these costs were at, Estimated at a, at a high level construction per square footage cost. Does that, does that answer, answer your question? Yeah. So I understand the higher contingency in option one because, you know, as you're renovating old systems and things, things will be more complicated than you envision. That makes sense. And then option two also has higher soft costs than option three, even though they're both new builds. Yeah, some of that is driven by the length of time to do the project, and that has to do with option two is also not been designed yet. Um, so there's not there's there's not only you know additional cost because it's going to take longer to to do that overall construction. It also hasn't been designed like the current third option. Uh, current the current option 
um, that went to bond has been uh, about 75% design through design development. Like it's almost ready to go to what's called the construction documents. And this option hasn't been de designed at all. So there's an additional cost on the design side. Okay, thank you. Well, Anybody else from the board with the first question? Anna, is your hand up again? Sure is. <laughs> Are you ready for my second comment or do you want to go to Corinne? Yes, I think everyone's on pause right now. I don't know, Corinne. And then Corinne will be, well, Corinne could go first and then you want to. Sounds great. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, I just missed. Um, I wondered if Sherry could repeat. Um, there was a comment she made about this, I think, was related to option three B, the um, maybe part of the four point four million reduction of the the um, the current bond design plan. What was the comment about the chorus room and community kitchen space? Was that part of that uh, four point four million? reduction is eliminating those two rooms yes. or was it something a community classroom that was um the community kitchen that was located on the second floor which is uh -huh. access to programs that would be eliminated we had some ideas about building a, a possible space within the existing cafeteria closer but it wouldn't be a full uh, working kitchen the choral room that currently is on located on the second floor, that would become a world language classroom. So the space that was on the first floor designated as a um, green room where they prepare for the theater productions and changing would could be also used as a chorus room. Um, and then some of the other spaces like a senior space would be fit along the balcony. Um, we wouldn't have a, a faculty room or a conference room. Um, and the world language room wouldn't have uh, windows. It would be skylights from the hallway. Thank you. Thank you. Anna? <clears throat> Yeah, I guess I'm going to use my uh, my second chance to speak to add on to what I was already speaking to and the fact that, um, right, if we're going to use our money efficiently, spending two extra years on construction costs to have a less complete product at the end um, just doesn't, again, you know, taxpayer dollars are going into this. I would much rather have a, a final product and spend about the same amount of money. And on top of that, when we think about our students, they're gonna have two less years of disruptions. Um, and, you know, there's no guarantee in that, you know, recruiting new students, but we're more likely to do that with, you know, a, a full complete new campus as opposed to a single building. Um, you know, when we think about student experience, we're talking about, you know, loss of, of experiences based on where they are in the buildings based on, you know, the timeline of the rebuilds or the renovations or the new builds or however we do this. Um, but really, we're not only are we using our money more efficiently, we're also making it a better experience for our students and our staff. So thank you. Yes, go ahead. So it's a very valid point. So one of the things that you'd be, let's say, throwing away if you went with this other option would be all of the design costs that have gone into the, the current option that went out to the voters. Um, and then escalation is, is, a, is a real cost. So, you know, adding two years to this project really adds a significant amount of cost, as you saw in the, the option um, three, just the amount of escalation that has gone into, um, you know, starting that project later because it, it didn't pass in March. Of the board members? Yes. Um, we did a lot of work on the cost per square foot for the new build and how it compared to other similar facilities around the country and around New England. Um, this dollar per square foot for a full renovation, 779 do you have any comparable transactions of full renovations, what they cost? <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one. Um, right, so so that value, that dollar per square foot includes the soft cost. Normally when I look at it, it's construction cost only. So in 
uh, the option three um, series here, the, the construction cost was $558 per square foot, which for Vermont is is in the range of what we're seeing. You know, I, I know Burlington High School is, is very high from a construction cost per square foot standpoint. Um, in New England, looking, you know, out, outside of Vermont, I know schools down in Massachusetts starting prices per square foot are 800 bucks a square foot up to a thousand. Um, so we're certainly coming in below that. Uh, there's other states uh, like the state of Maine that has a little more efficiency in their in their cost. Um, but Vermont is very special, very unique from the standpoint of our, our labor resources are, are tight and that's driving some of the higher construction costs for the state. But overall, it's it's on par with what we're seeing in the state. So it's typical for the renovation to cost more dollars per square foot than a new build. Uh, how, how much of that building is able to be salvaged in that renovation? Right, and and on the construction cost side for option one, say. With the with the full renovation of bringing up to today's code standards, uh, we were in the neighborhood of uh, four hundred and fifty four dollars a square foot compared to the uh, five fifty eight. So it is coming in at uh, less expensively, but there is higher higher soft costs for the renovations. And that would that it. was the four year duration, temporary student housing, and escalation and like. That's right. Yep. Yeah, so we we have in the construction costs for option one, we have the we have the temporary classrooms and them and, and them being in place for four and a half years. So that's a considerable chunk of money. Um, and yeah, so we we have that built in on the construction cost. That's in addition to the uh, four fifty four per square foot. Would, would you guys be able to? Potentially build a high school on the football field as part of the huddle without uh, wall school going on itself, like in the current school as it is. If you guys be able to build just a high school for now uh, with the potential of adding on that in the future. Uh, and would that, would you be able to do so while eliminating the trailers for the students and all that other stuff? Because they should be able to stay in this school, right? It, you're talking about the hybrid option, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, in, to the intent would to not have to use temporary trailers in this option so that the students would remain in the existing high school until the, the new building is built. And then probably the middle school students would have to shift into that existing high school while renovations are done to the middle school. And then you'd shift the students into their, you know, renovated you know, newer space and then demo the high school. Right. I'm answering that yeah. for her. <laughs> More of it area. Yeah, and, and really option two B was was building that high school in on, on the football field, keeping the existing building intact uh, so that school school could proceed, you know, it as it does day to day. Uh get the high get the new high school building complete. And then, yes, move the middle school students over to the high school wing because the high school students are now in the new high school. Renovate the middle school wing to the standpoint of we're talking flooring, ceiling. Um, it's it's not bringing it up to up to today's code standards and option two B. Um, and then once that middle school renovation is done, moving the middle schoolers back from the high school wing back over to the middle school. And then the high school wing would get demolished. Any other questions from the board? Okay, Josh, go ahead. Now on 2B, there's a um, central heating plant in addition at 2.5 million. Was there never an option that would be able to eliminate that? Or is there no way to eliminate that by having a High school power the middle school. Yeah, so that that's that's something that we we looked at with option two B, because with the high school wing coming down, that's where the central heating plant is is currently. 
Um, so the plan with that would be to build an annex off of the side as new construction with a new central heating plant there. Um, the advantage of that is everything is brand new. You're working in, uh, you know, basically a, a, a total greenfield type space with that annex. So everything could be brand new. So from that standpoint, it's a nicer and longer lasting solution. I don't know if that, does that fully answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if there, if there was no way to like get rid of that, you know, to have that high school power that the middle school as it currently does. That's all. Okay, yeah, let me let me take that a step further. Yeah, so the high school that would be built in the on the football field to keep costs down, we're focusing on just building out what's necessary to to satisfy that building. So in the future, if there is a middle school built off next to it where the, the yellow shading is, that would have its own mechanical system that's for that building. We're we're trying to we're trying to right size the mechanical system to the point where you're not building more than you need on day one. Anyone else? Anyone on Zoom? Board. All right. Do you want to have any final comments before we turn the public loose here? I don't have any final comments. No. I do have one comment. We did look at with option one of utilizing the existing arena, uh, hockey arena, instead of employing. Uh, mobile classrooms and the costs were even higher. So, uh, and also reductions in the phasing to bring it back into like a, a two or three year window versus the four and a half. And just the costs are crazy high to build temporary facilities in that arena. So we scrapped that idea. <laughs> All right. Um, in a minute, we'll open for uh, public comment. And uh, I just want to read something from uh, the state guidelines. If you are speaking from the floor, floor please um, identify yourself and your town clearly so our uh, clerk can record that. We are going to ask you to limit your time to three minutes with a warning at 20, uh, 30 seconds to three minutes. Um, again, it will be the same as the board. If you've already spoken once, we'll wait till everyone else has had a chance to ask or make their comments. Um, if you're on Zoom, please put your question in the chat. Ben Ford will be monitoring the chat and he will interject when appropriate to get your question in. And then if you would need to speak to anything to clarify that you would be welcome to do it, do that if necessary. From the, um, I'm just going to read this out loud one more time. Order and decorum shall be observed by all persons present at the meeting. Neither members of the board nor the members of the public shall delay or interrupt the proceedings or the peace of the meeting or interrupt or disturb any member while speaking. Members of the board and members of the public are prohibited from making personal impertinent, threatening, or profane remarks. Um, I will be recognizing the people, so please don't just launch your question until you've been recognized and have stated your name and your town. Thank you. So we're now open for public comment. Yes, go ahead. Mark Weinstein, Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, I'm gonna talk about financing because I think that's really important. I appreciate everything they did. There are a couple of bills that went through the House recently, and I emailed them to some board members. One of the bills was H-871, which actually was signed into law today by the governor. The other one was 887, which is the yield bill. I'm just going to quote some of the sections that I think are pertinent if we go ahead with option three. Uh, H-71, uh, section four creates a seven-member state aid school, constru school construction working group to study and design a state plan for new statewide school construction aid program. The group would be required to convene 
its first meeting by August 21st of 2024, submit its findings and recommendations in the form of a proposed legislation to the General Assembly by December 15th, 2024, and ceases to exist on December 31st, 2024. They authorized up to six meetings and a maximum of 10 meetings. That passed, that is the school aid program. I don't know if Paul's familiar with 871 or 887. Uh, the other section of that is section 4H, Creek Program Construction Aid. The working group shall consider whether and to what extent state aid should be made available to school districts that begins construction projects prior to the establishment or renewal of a state school construction aid program. Those are the pertinent asks. It's about a 13 page. There's a lot of legal stuff. You guys can still read it. You just have to go to the General Assembly website. Uh, 887, which possibly might be vetoed, is the yield bill. Current yield is, I believe, then 98.93, which gives us a tax rate, which is not that important. That says the important thing there is possible reinstatement of Vermont's excess spending adjustment. Act 127 suspended the excess spending through fiscal year 29. That has been repealed. So that section 19 repeals that uh, suspension and makes the threshold effective July 1st, 2023, meaning that where it'll be used for the calculation of tax rates in fiscal year 26, and I believe 27. I don't know when anything passed that. Another important part, since we're already paid, we're about well, section 19, Mark, there's 30 more seconds. Okay, a second, and I'll get at the end because I don't have enough time. Section 19, for all bonds approved by voters prior to July 21st, July 1st, 2024, voter approved bond payments for principal and interest shall not be included in quote unquote educational spending for purposes of calculating excess spending pursuant to things. I'm still waiting to hear from AOE, Agency of Education, uh, Cassandra Ryan. Uh, Julie Briggs Campbell, Bob Donahue, and Julie Richter from JFO, because there seems to be a lot of confusion in Montpelier about where this is going to go. Thank you. Um, Ed, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes. I... Is your name Ed in your town? Edwin English, Woodstock. Um, I have a concern about this. Uh, Flat roofs. I think it should be because if you live in one and Woodstock at least a sliding snowstorm, you wouldn't have a flat roof. But I was concerned on any village. Thank you. That that would be a cost saving measure. That's the reason that it was discussed. <clears throat> Somebody else had a hand up, I think. Um, Kelly, no. Doug Leonard, Doug Leonard, let's stop. Um, geothermal will not work. I'll tell you guys, 15, 20 years ago, ran it stayed electric over less than I tried it. Very umpteen thousand miles of pipe network. Would stop on the tried it, but millions of dollars. Thousands of dollars into the system didn't work. And like Ed said, yes, you need a slope to move. Okay. And uh, just like, and then between option one, two, and three on the bottom lines of bottom three, you said you're going to get more students and stuff like that. And then on the very bottom line of, of plan B, the new school, you say, we will probably not attract new students. I mean, and have you done core samples for this building? Structurally, there's nothing wrong with this building. You can put a slope loop on it. You know, have you done core samples and the slab and the brick and you know have engineered structural building command give you a report on the existing buildings? You know, I mean, we think in buildings 200 years old get built and we remodel them and fix them and they're back in service. You know, and you can also put solar panels. In every room, or something like that. They make solar windows that look like a window. The be a room where you can put propane heaters in there. You know, there's a lot of things, a lot of options you can do with cut power. But now, are you going to have wood frame or metal frame or gypsum board or or plywood walls? What are you going to do? Nobody's nobody's seen the interior of the, of the building. You know, you, you haven't showed it. 
the hallways and the room systems and if we have any fire, you have off ceilings. You know, there's a lot of costs have some savings to do. You know. And why do you need a view? Why do you need a back mountain view for the kids to look out the window? They're, they're sitting in the school room for learning something. Look at a chalkboard. <laughs> Thank you. My wife would you like me to speak to some of the comments? If you'd like to speak to anything, that would be. I can speak to a couple of the comments. Uh, there was some geo um, tech investigation that went into the, the compaction of the soils and viability for uh, the geothermal thermal uh, wells that was conducted on the site. As far as investigation into the, the envelope, what we know is the current building envelope doesn't meet the energy code. I mean, it, 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 no, 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 we're talking about structural. Yeah, it, and you've never done a core sample. So into the steel? No, into the ground. You've never done core samples of the slab or what's underneath the slab. It, it, there were geotech. There was geotech. You're, you're talking that, about geothermal for well. It, it, it's also for the. It's totally different. It, it's also for the design of the slab of of the slab. It's compaction test of the of the soils. That that, that those were for, done preliminary. Well, you're not going to build your bedroom for well right next to the foundation. There was also an extensive structural report, especially in the gymnasium. Uh, that was incorporated into our cost estimate. Because lack of maintenance. Um, now, when Steve Carlton was here, they cut his budget and, you know, the structural items I he was not lack of maintenance. Well, structural items was not a lack of maintenance. It was something else. And incorporating his views would be a question for the architect. We're not the architect. <laughs> Uh, Pamela, thanks. Uh, Pamela Fraser Barnard. Um, well, I wanted to first just say thank you to the board and to, to the panel for all the work that you're doing. And I really appreciate that you're taking this up and reviewing the options and, and everything, and all the work that you're putting into it. Um, that said, I'm really surprised to see free options here that are in the same price tag range as the bond that just failed. And it didn't just fail by a little, it failed by 10%, which is pretty significant. And to me, um, and you know, to me personally, and um, what that says um, is that people can't afford that price tag. People can't afford that price tag range. So um, the, the full renovation is just something that I don't think is going to pass uh, anything that's in the hundred million price tag range, I do not think it's going to pass. And I really urge you to consider what can be done for less than that. And maybe it's a you know a longer plan and some of the costs new windows get built into a different kind, not a bond, you know, over over a period of time. But there are a lot of school buildings from this era that are renovated and they look fantastic. So this is not impossible. Another thing that I just like you and I really ask you to consider taking off the bullet points for arguments for the new build or any very expensive bill is the um, the idea that we're going to attract new students with a nicer building because the birth rates are completely flat. They've been increasing for 20 years, not just in our area, but the entire country and every single school district in ascending town within an hour's radius has a decreasing enrollment as well. So there, it's not that, that we don't attract them because uh, our building isn't nice, they don't exist. <laughs> so uh, I don't think that's a, a compelling bullet point. I also urge you to tell us what the current goals for modern teaching learning are. That's always used as a, a bullet point to tell us why we need a new building, but nobody ever tells us what that means. I am an educator and I don't know what that means. So. <laughs> Um, I also think probably a renovation could accomplish some modern uh, spaces. And I find it kind of funny that you're getting rid of, you wanted to get rid of the Newview Lab, which is a very modern uh, teaching tool. Uh, wait a second. Thank you. Um, so I get pissed about it. I just, I really want to see this building renovated and fixed, um, but I, I think it really needs to be affordable. <laughs> Thank you. Was somebody in the back who had his hand up? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, 
I agree. Your name is going to be Roy Bates, Woodstock, Vermont. I was an eight year selectman, chairman of the board a long time, and I was also a board member up here for four years back in the late 70s and early 80s. And the last two speakers are completely correct because geothermal, the groundwater table here is at 38 degrees. In Florida, it's 72. So it's feasible to have it in Florida, the geothermal here, but heat, you have to have to put too much heat in or get them temperature of that water up to where it is good for geothermal. Okay, going on. Uh, we'll start these, I look at these options. Are you planning to put one of these options before the town? Towns are on. Is that, here? Is that a question for me? That, that, that's a, a board decision to be made, sir. Well, I would suggest you don't because anything that costs almost as much as the last option will go down. In Woodstock, it used to be, it doesn't now probably, but three to five percent raise in the town budget and the tax rate was all they would stand. And I don't think that anybody's going to stand the kind of tax rate increase you're going to have to have to build a new school. The other thing is, the you're planning to keep the daily gymnasium in any of these options. Um, the renovation option keeps the existing high school. What's that? The renovation option, option A, keeps the existing high school gym. It does, because I used to referee around the state here, and this this gym was in the top four or five at South of Route 4 for shape to have playoffs or anything. You probably need to reconstruct the uh, locker rooms and stuff like that. Well, I think we should keep that gymnasium, and I don't see any reason to do the fields at all. We keep the fields. Those two options, you're going to save quite a bit of money. I know the original high school probably needs some reconstruction, but brick doesn't go away. Concrete doesn't go away. You don't need to tear it all out. Just need to retrofit it. 30 seconds. And uh, I don't think we need to go into all that expense. We tear those walls out and then we go in and retrofit those rooms down there. And then in the meantime, we use a middle school for some of the students and this gymnasium and this building for some classrooms. And that's the way we should go. If you put any one of those three options, up before the voters. I guarantee you they'll go down. Thank you. Uh, Jim? Jim Hack County of Killington. Um, with 887 in place and 871 in place, maybe it'll be vetoed, whatever. Um, if you read through it, I hope every single one of you board members have a copy of 887. Um, it's going to tell you what the state is looking at, newer and fewer. <laughs> about how it could possibly any dollar over will be uh, also in the penalty phase. I have questions as far as saying 2026, this building could start. I asked over eight months ago for reports on what work was done for engineering, um, such as in the stormwater. Um, I was given a report that re referenced back to the 2017 um, stormwater permits. Um, Kurt, Right now, let's be honest, if you just had to go in for a brand new stormwater permit, it's two or three years to get all your information back or whatever on that. I mean, we're sitting here and we're telling folks that we it's going to take a couple of years to do some of these other things that are, I agree, is way out of price anyway. But this escalation cost, you're not even in front of Act 250 yet, and you don't even have to pay. You also know they just said again, in ANR setbacks from rivers and streams, and they're also talking about flood areas. I mean, this hasn't done that yet, but you need to check at 887, at least wait for the state to tell us how to state how they're going to go about taxing the schools. Okay, that's what we need to do. Geothermal, I have to disagree with all you. I'm getting a 6,000 square foot house at my home with a three and a half ton system since 2002. 
and it works perfectly fine some 20 something years later. Whoever says it doesn't work in, I'm, uh, in, in Vermont, I'm sorry, but that's the fact. So please, just the board members, leave 887, and you decide if you should have a vote in September before you know the rules, or should you wait till March when the rules are gonna be coming out, as Mark has said, somewhere they're supposed to have reconvene and have answers at the end of December. That's that's my suggestion to you folks. I mean, if you think right now, your tax rate, when you have your reappraisal, will be $1.68 per 25, 25 seconds. I thought I was gonna get told at 30. But a dollar per hundred, okay? <laughs> now, within three years, you will be $2 to 20 to $2.35 at your 100%. And if you think houses at 500 now at a million, people are going to come here and spend 22500 plus the local share, you're crazy. So wait till March and get the answers. Select, I mean, school board members, please read 887. Thank you, Jim. Yes, I would be sick far, though. I live in Woodstock, so I have comments kind of related to other ones. So, regarding 887, I don't know what's going to happen with that, but my understanding is that the way it's written, any bond would basically cost us double. It's like not even an option to do a bond if it stays the way it is. So, or at least that's the way I understand it. Now, why is that happening? Why are they doing that? They want to stop construction. Now, I don't know why, but there's a lot of rumors going around that the state wants to make hub high schools. And there are rumors going around that say, whether we do this or not, if the state wants to make hub high schools, even if we do this, they could say we're closing you down. So I think it's extremely risky to make any financial decisions when you don't know how you're going to be taxed, and you don't know if there's going to be hub high schools and we're not going to be part of that. Now, if there's a way for Woodstock to be the hub and be bigger and make an agreement with the state and make it work with other towns, that would be fantastic. But at this point, it seems like a real gamble to be putting our money on the line without knowing what is going to happen in those situations. And the other thing I wanted to say regarding this bill happening I talked to someone at the state level that handles flood control and rivers. He told me that he met with members of the board twice. He said this plan would never fly. And he said, did they go through Act 250 yet? And I said, as far as I know, not at all. So I don't know what's going on with the approvals with building in the floodplain, but due to displacement, building another building while keeping this one up, I was told that's really questionable. So I think that telling everyone this is easy, like Jim was saying, when we have to still go through Act 250 and we don't even know if they're gonna say you can build this much space in a floodplain, which will displace too much water, even though you're not in the flood zone. I think that's important. I think it would be good if you have answers about that and security about that to let people know so that we don't worry about that. And the last thing I wanted to say is the way these um, options have been presented as it, one of you said something like you made them kind of like to get to the same goals as the new bond was. I feel like that's the wrong way to go about this. If you guys had actually done the listening tours that you proposed you were going to do after the seconds. bond fail, then okay, then um, maybe you would have heard from people. Like I would say a better way to go about this would be to say, okay, well, what do we think people can afford? And Maybe you pick some numbers, 10, 20, 30, 50 million or something like that. And you say, what can we get? Let's start with this, with our safety, with like what we absolutely need. Let's put those line items in one by one and present to people, this is what we can get for these different numbers. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about that? That's a better way to go about this instead of trying to recreate the bond in a renovation. That, that's really not what people were saying no to. People are saying no oh. to the whole thing. To one mm -hmm. Sorry, thank you. Maybe just a couple of brief comments, a couple of points. Um, the school district is working with um, civil engineer, CEA um, um, environment or CEA uh, engineering. Uh, Dave Marshall is a civil engineer. He's very much up to speed on all the Act 250 requirements. 
and the stormwater consultant is Andreas Terrazzo. He's also very much up to speed with all of the new three acre rule requirements, which are which are new stormwater rules, um, specific for that are required specific for this site. So a, a significant design has gone into the, the the option that went out to went out to bond. No designs have gone into any of the other options, and they would be a requirement that has to get done during that design development uh, timeline that we mentioned uh, would be a, a year and a half. But a significant investigation has gone into both the Act 250 and the stormwater designs for the existing pr proposed addition uh, or uh, new building. Uh, and then just a, a minor comment relating to the uh, Act 877, I think it is. 887. 887, yeah, thank you. Uh, not that I'm not up to speed on that, but what I do know that that subcommittee is going to be doing from now until December is they're going to be looking at requirements for school school districts um, to go through in order to be eligible for school construction aid. But an example of that is they're going to require require school districts to go through a master planning process, very similar to the master planning project process and strategic planning process that we're doing right here. And they want those uh, master planning processes to not be driven solely by architects so that these, you know, proposed uh, designs aren't just simply looking at the aesthetic upgrades, but they're looking at the full, you know, programmatic um, um, benefits um, to, to these future projects. So that's one of the pieces that committee will be looking at. I can't, I can't speak to all of them. Uh, one other comment related to Act 250. All the options have to obviously meet Act 250. We are not exempt uh, from meeting those, those options. One thing we do know for fact <clears throat> is that option three, the footprint of that option matters the most in terms of um, Act 250 requirements and um, uh, stormwater um, co coverage requirements. The existing high school and middle school has to come down uh, in order to meet that requirement. Option two, the hybrid, because it's three story, it's going to be a much larger, much smaller footprint when both the middle school and high school are in place. So that will clearly meet uh, the Act 250 requirements uh, for coverage if, if, when the middle school and high school come, come down. Uh, there is also one thing that is not um, that the school board school board's aware of is the uh, three acre rule uh, requirements, even though this is not a priority site without any um, construction at some point, at least some of the uh, parking lots are going to have to uh, meet or those um, coverage requirements, regardless of any school um, construction. I would like to just assure the public that's listening that we are following all of these bills, all of these um, various rumors and untruths and half truths coming from Montpelier. Uh, a number of the board members are tied into that, along with our uh, financial um, manager and our superintendent. So we are very well educated on these things at this time. We've been highly attuned to what's coming out of Montpelier. And I could just say for 44 years that I've been part of um, underneath the AOE as a teacher. Um, they change their minds all the time and they don't make anything clear and that has not changed. So what they say today could be very different next week um, until it's actually voted through. It's, it's you know, anyone's guess. Julie, you had your hand up. And yes. Michelle. And it's going to be two questions because it seems like people are asking too. My question is this current septic system and any renovation. I know there's a septic truck here two weeks ago dealing with our system. So that's one thing. The other question to the board and the committee is, did you consider actually moving the middle school to Prosper Valley and we put a true six, seven, eight? Yeah. That's it. And, oh, I'm Mr. Moss. And I'm also the bookkeeper here. <laughs> Sorry. We probably right. answered the first part of the question. Septic? Uh, in the renovation option, we're assuming to replace you know, all major systems, which includes plumbing uh, and, and wastewater. That, that will re, you know, require cutting into existing slabs and installing new you know, wastewater systems. 
I think that would be mm -hmm. a current assumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that that level of design has gone into it yet. And I suppose that was, yeah. Yeah. the configuration committee, maybe someone from that can speak to this, but as far as I know, there's been no discussion of making Prosper a 678. And the capacity of that building is not such to to increase the island 110 students. Oh no, I would mean renovate at there. And yeah. So again, we have those issues with water plane and mm -hmm. you know when we did the renovation, there were concerns that we didn't exceed the current footprint as well. I think that's why we didn't pursue that mm -hmm. Thank you. Michelle, Michelle been looking at it over the summer. Um, Carrie, I went through the same thing with you did, the same thing you did. I contacted 13 representatives for our state, education representatives, and we getting a lot of mixed messages about the hub. And I just wanted to point out quickly that if that did happen, if Montpelier did shift and designate a hub school and the South is not a hub school, we'd still be having to be responsible for that then. Act and trade from Woodstock, given uh, uh, the issues in Woodstock itself with our current water aqueduct company and all the uncertainty about what's happening um, and their inability to make certain upgrades or even provide necessary water to buildings in Woodstock uh, currently. And nobody knows actually. The, uh, the town of Woodstock has a letter of intent to purchase, but everything seems to be up in the air. With so many of the things that we're hearing this evening or discussing, they're so uncertain. Why can't you just fix what absolutely needs to be fixed now and see what's happening as we go through the rest of this year and into next spring when we might have a clearer picture of what's going on? before any kind of commitment could be made to such an enormous expense. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, did you have your hand up? No, okay. Yeah. Kelly? So I'm Kelly Linton from Woodstock. And like I said before, the state came in here a few years ago and did a walkthrough with the board and told them what needed to be fixed. And they had a price of between 12 and 18 million dollars. Like I said, I have an email of it. I'd be more than happy to share it with anybody because when you're going with a hundred and twenty million dollar school, that's going to be a last front, which is a perfect example for a school shooting, and everybody's worried about that. So we're gonna get both through glass. That's a question. I don't believe that's part of the design, but that would be a question. So there you go. There's a school shooting. But the other part is, is how long is this uh, bond that we're going to get? How long does it take to pay that back? Uh, 30 to 40 if there's like 10. <laughs> so the tax is going to go up 15, 18%. Well, everybody in this room. So if it's 40 years, I'm not going to be here in 40 years. So does that mean that that tax rate is going to stay the same for my grandson and my great grandson? And they're going to keep paying it because nobody here is going to be here to say, oh, we got to stop. We got to minus off 18% off taxes now. So that's a really big concern because what I brought up in one of the other meetings was the senior solarium that got built, got built right on top of a sewer line. And oh well, we didn't know. We didn't know. Well, then who was responsible? Is PCI going to be responsible for future additions and know where all these pipes are? Are they going to be the contractors? I highly doubt it. It's going to be somebody else that comes in, says, "Oh well, we can do it for you for this amount of price." Meanwhile, you're building another addition on top of another septic line. And then you come down to the taxpayers and say, well, so the main question is why, where did this ever go? Because it was in the Vermont standard because the state probably put it there on the 12 to $18 million fix. Thank you. 
I forgot to say one thing. Yeah, I have one exactly. I was going to have one of you address that twelve to eighteen million dollar fix. Regarding putting a building on a septic line? No, no, no. The the report that came out several years ago. Oh yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah. So there there was a study done by Bureau Veritas that was um the agency of education, you know, through a, a legislation bond that passed was to hire Bureau Veritas to do an assessment of all of the schools in the state for the purpose of understanding the magnitude of the cost um, of the needs for all of these schools around the state to, to be able to uh, add that to the conversation to bring back the school construction aid. So we actually worked with Bureau Veritas um, on that contract. We didn't do the, any of the evaluation for the building. We collected a lot of the utility data and whatnot um, from each of the schools that were, went into the, their energy modeling. But just so you understand, that was a, a replacement cost value. Um, so I'll give you an ex example. What they do is they go in and they take an inventory of all your existing systems, you know, your roof, your mechanical equipment, um, you know, your, your plumbing lines, and they plug those pieces of equipment into a, a software that comes up with what is the average uh, life cycle of that equipment, and then it spits out a, a dollar amount to, to replace that equipment in kind. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't take into account additional costs for the contractor to do the what's called the general conditions. It doesn't take into account the, the, the design time that goes in for the architectural engineer. It doesn't take into account any code uh, upgrades that are required, giving you the example of the, of the roof re replacement, where you have to, in order to meet the energy code, you have to uh, increase that the insulation on the roof. It's just a, a replacement cost for that rubber membrane, but then there's the added costs that you have that are going to be incorporated into that when you have to bring those systems up to current code. Um, so th those costs, costs were strictly replacement costs. They also didn't address things like ADA accessibility. It was part of the report to say, these schools don't meet current ADA requirements, but there were not dollars associated into bringing those buildings up to the current ADA code. I'm gonna have to wait until everyone's had a chance for a first question. I just question. to ask him about what he was saying. I, if you put on a roof, are you required to bring it up to code? Yes, you are. You're required to meet the energy code in the state of Vermont. If you do anything to the roof or just if you replace it completely? If you replace it completely. And you're telling me, to my answer to my question, that they didn't allow for this? They did not allow for that because it wasn't part of the cost. That's your word. All right. Um, Kelly, so we're not going to go into the okay. debate. So, are there further questions? <laughs> Um, Raina. So, um, Raina Bishop, Reading, Vermont. Um, I work for the central office. One of my job duties is your district central registrar, meaning I enroll, I process the enrollment of every student for the entire district. You should know that um, the principal of an elementary school in Ascending Town called me on behalf of the students, asking specifically if we were looking at a new build because the students were excited about that prospect and were hoping to at least realize some of the benefits of a new build in their junior and senior year. Um, I have already enrolled more Ludlow students this year, um, even before the end of this school year than I did the entire year last year. Uh, I was visited by a parent who specifically wanted to know what towns the family could move to specifically to send their child to this school. Uh, whether it was in district or ascending town. So while I do understand the concept that we're not going to experience an explosion of babies, we're not going to experience a, an explosion of students, you're not, I, I would ask you to not necessarily look at it as we need more bodies. You need the bodies that are going elsewhere to come here. And they are interested in the new build. So if we get five Hartman students out of their 80, that's 75 kids going elsewhere. So obviously we're not going to attract all of them, but we're not going to attract any more if nothing changes. Is there anyone online from Zoom? 
Yes. Hi, I'm Barbara Kennedy, and I live in Woodstock. And there was a comment earlier that there had been some assessment of the square foot cost of similar buildings in the United States. Is there a similar school, high school, middle school, of this design already completed in the United States, operational? And where is it? And what is the grand success rate of all the students with views and e trainings and all of that? Yeah, so when I was providing cost per square foot numbers, I was, I was talking about what we've seen in Vermont. There hasn't been a ton of school construction in Vermont. The most recent one that's underway right now is Burlington High School. So that's the most recent and relevant data point. I'm not talking about cost. I'm talking about the design. Is there another school like this that's operational somewhere in the country, approximately the same size, that has a student enrollment and has it dramatically positively impacted or perhaps negatively the student enrollment and their success rate? Does anybody have an idea or does that not matter? I don't know if that might mention a question for the architect, but I, I don't know what I see you guys. Yeah. Unless we could provide some. Yeah. We're going to have really a contextual question for the architect. He's designed quite a few schools recently. So I'm sure we can provide an answer for that. But uh, we did not design it. Uh, we are currently working on the Burlington High School, so we can talk about costs, but program, I don't know. Well, I'm just thinking we can't be the only state and the only school that needs this kind of discussion and this kind of evaluation. So if one exists like this mm -hmm. somewhere, well, let's see mm -hmm. what the results were. Yeah, I think one thing that's unique about Woodstock is the number of um, school choice schools that could funnel into the school district that could be potential. Uh, you know, future students. That that, that, that scenario mean? probably doesn't exist in lots of other places. So. We just spoke to enrollment, so that would be a, a piece that would answer the enrollment, that the potential. But we've said in our meetings that we're building for the students we have now. And we hope to retain them. And if we have capacity to add more, we would gladly add more. I will say this with the option three, we can always put back that wing if it is reduced. It can go right back in 15 years from now if we need it. That that, that is built into the option three then. Anybody else have a first question? Roger. Roger Rivera Killington. What is the current enrollment in the middle and high school? And how many graduated this past year? 455, and we have 83 graduates. 455 total. That is the Okay, and we got 80 graduates, so not much more. Right? And when my daughter Alyssa graduated in 2015, we were about 80. So the enrollment. So the enrollment is pretty much stable. If we can keep it stable, we're lucky. Um, secondly, to, to um, the investigative on the wastewater and Act 250, investigative, is there actually permit applications in process? No, you went to twice. Can you speak to how long that process is to move for prior approval? We, it was addressed by the civil engineer. I would have to look back on the details, but it was within within our timeline that we have established to, to go to construction. Days, weeks, hours, can you give me a number, please? That wasn't was really answer. Probably a six month process. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't want to speak to I doubt that. the I email that I, I read about eight months ago, but it was within the construction timeline that we had established. That's a very um, aggressive number. Yeah. Well, we, we can provide a follow up detail with that. Again, thank, thank you from the civil engineer, and we're not the civil engineers. I've got to leave, but I've got to tell you one more thing. I talked to one of our distinguished, Roy Bates for SOC, one of our distinguished county representatives for Montpelier. And I asked 
how much money we are getting off this gambling bill we have. All the uh, horse racing and all the um, track tickets and all that, which when it was originally voted, it was about 100% for education in any, any of the projects. I don't think I've ever seen a report that says how much each school is getting out of that education fund. Probably they're even using it in the general fund where it goes. Mm -hmm. Pay for things they can't. Yeah, that's 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 you need an accountability of that gambling account. Thank you. Somebody maybe can get it. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Um, well, Mark was first and then Pamela. Okay, we talked a lot about uh, construction yeah. per square foot. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a copy of a memo that Jim Finn and Bob Donahue at AOE sent to me dated uh, February 16th to Sherry Souza about a preliminary approval for school's construction. And the bottom line at the end was they approved this project, the new building costs that they allowed, because they are only allowing 100, you guys know this, $180, 180, 180 gross square footage per student. At 600 students, we're at 263.33 square footage. And at 450, I don't even want to go there. And so that's what they approved. So even if we got state aid, as Ben, I think, acknowledged to me when I met him walking the other day, the maximum cost for state participation right. that we may get is going to be $82,854, 82854 500 82 mil. What's that? 82 mil. Yeah, 82 mil. Thank you, Jim. So uh, the, the, the bullet points are very misleading. Vermont Education, AOE, has approved this program. The only option with this designation, and they've agreed to fund if the state becomes available. Uh, Kerry, I, I know you said to be civil, and I'm civil. I didn't like the way you denigrated the AOE. They're civil servants. I was a civil servant. You're a civil servant. A lot of us here are. They're doing the best they can. It's very complicated because the legislature actually has to act. And if we have an issue, with what the AOE or the JFO is doing, the issue should be with the legislator, not with those organizations. They're just as much in the dark, as you said, as we are, and our legislators are the ones who have to set something up. And AOE, JFO, tax department, they're all separate. They work off of each other. And that's why they've been very careful not to say anything. What they've really been great at saying to me is, and I haven't heard from the board that often, we really don't know the answer to that question. You seem to have always answers to the questions as based on this, never willing to say, well, we're not sure. And that, that goes to transparency and accountability. And that's what's going to get the bond passed because I support a new school if we can afford it. Thank you, Mark. Pamela. Um, I, my my son graduated from uh, the high school last year, and he'd probably be really annoyed if he knew that I was going to share something that he said. But he um, he and I were talking about the the possibility of these high school hubs and all of that, you know, that's being discussed. And and really, um, I understand that, and I think a lot of people understand that conversation as a continuation of Act Forty Six because it's the same problem. Vermont is losing enrollment numbers. And we can't afford. I mean, it's a very serious problem. So it's it's a continuation of looking for solutions. Act 46 was actually not successful in saving money at all, but it's that thinking, you know. So anyway, we were talking about it, and he said, Do you think the school board is being proactive talking to other high schools in the area, like Hartford or whatever? Um, because that would be if the state's gonna do it to them anyway, why don't they Try to build a partnership along the lines of something that would, you know, make more people happy than being forced because nobody likes being forced into anything. So I thought, you know, I don't really love that idea in a lot of ways, but I also think it's really creative thinking. And I think it's important to keep um, minds open to all kinds of possibilities, and especially to Jim's past point, we know so little about what is happening. And the new Secretary of Education is a, is a signal that this is the direction we're going, more mergers. 
Um, so I think that, that we really need to take that very, very seriously. And those conversations are happening, Pamela, with other districts around us. That's great. I'll tell him. <laughs> Yes. Yep, Doug Leonard. Um, Roy Bates had just left. He's a meteorologist. He knows more about geothermal than probably anybody in this room. So that, and I know several places they put plowed millions of dollars into it. It never worked. Um, second, um, do you know what underground utilities are there underneath the high school underneath the football field? I, I would imagine that exploration has been done by, by the civil. Do you know what utilities are underneath that football field? I don't personally know uh, because I'm not the civil engineer. Well, I do. So. I know what's underneath there. So you're going to have a contractor come in and rip up an eight inch water main that feeds the other side of the river or anything else that's in there? You know, just like, just like you haven't done your homework. Point of order, time. point of order, please. This is a comment section. We're not questioning, answering unless uh, it's deemed appropriate. And your personal income tax supposedly is going to go up 18 to 20 percent next year. So it's what you do, what you get the counts, you know, keep this keep milk of the tax there. Thank you. Thank you. Kirk Peters and has a couple of questions. Is that Marina? You can you see Marina? Thank you. If I pull up the chat, it pulls it up on the screen. Are you okay with that? Um, yeah. It's in the chat. It's there. Yeah, but it's not coming up on mine. Yeah. May I ask one more question? Here's the uh, we have a question on the screen. You have a few on the top. Um, Can you see it? No, it's not coming up on my screen. This is straight from Kurt. I have it set to everybody. Oh, wait, here we go. All right, Ernie. Oh, Ernie Fernandez. Um, so it sounds like a board member. Um, not sure when I will get a chance to tell you this. Okay, hang on. Can you read it? 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 Can you read you guys remember this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, one comment regarding that is option 3B, it allows for a lot more solar when you do make a, the roof flat. Uh, and the latest rendering does show that um, all of the options can accommodate solar. Mm -hmm. But not, none of the options in the mm -hmm. cost for solar. Correct. Yeah, Jim's going to probably speak to that. So the quick answer is yes. We've looked at putting solar over the parking lot. Uh, the difficult answer is that we're limited by state legislature to not generating more than one megawatt of solar electricity on our entire series of campuses. We already have solar at Oscar Valley, we have solar at West, we have solar at Reading. We've got a little tiny bit of solar here. We've got about 250 kilowatts of solar, which only allows us 750 kilowatts that we can put on this campus. We have plenty of room to do that without putting it over the parking lot when we put a new building on here, regardless of which design it is, as long as it's got the structural integrity to support. Mm -hmm. What else you got, Rand? So, Kurt Peterson, during the run up to the bond vote, quite a lot of money was pledged to support the project. Did the failure of the bond affect the surety of those pledges? Yeah, no. Um, those uh, all donors have reaffirmed their pledges for um, another, you know, for the continuation of the project. David Steele Woodstock, why did you not factor in a smaller student target growth plan? What are your strategies for attracting this number of new students other than a new building? Yeah, I mean. Um, Carrie just spoke to. I mean, the, the plan is to build for the existing population. Um, I mean, in terms of strategies, there's a lot of discussion, but nothing that's been made in terms of a plan. But um, the idea is to, I think we've all talked about it um, tonight. You know, going out to Choice Towns is the, is the immediate um, place where we would look to grow our own. 
All right. Kurt Peterson has another question. In most towns in the district, property education taxes may be increasing by as much as 21% or even more. Doesn't this put the repayment of a school construction bond in a new frightening perspective? Yeah, it's a new baseline for sure. And uh, as many people have said tonight, we're going to have to see what the state does, right? There's a lot of things that are in the works, a lot of developments. All right. And last question, David Steele. How about improved programs and retention of quality educators? I'm not exactly sure where he's going with that. We have very little turnover in, in our school system. I'm aware of that because I sign all of the contracts and I regularly visit with the HR person who has the, the openings listed and there are really very few compared to the districts that I see around us if you go on school spring uh, and look at that. So I think that our retention rate is quite good. Uh, it's a housing factor more so than a uh, interest in being in working here that causes some to not be able to take a job, but sadly. Um, so I, I can answer that piece of it. Um, Bob? Hi. As a public citizen, Bob Cream Pompey, as one who's read the uh, deep bore test pits for uh, deep bore wells for uh, geothermal, Temperatures are pushing 49 to 50 degrees. Plenty warm enough for as many wells as the budget will allow. Thank you. Thank you. Elisa, <clears throat> Elisa um, Charlo from Woodstock. I just wanted to comment on what's been coming up regarding enrollment and the education. I totally get the need for more enrollment. I don't know what the capacity of the, this current school is compared to what there is, but um, but I feel like like I, a few board meetings ago, or maybe more than a few ago, I remember talking about like a loss of enrollment, and it didn't sound like there was any analysis going on about why there were why there's a loss of each individual student. I feel like each student that is not enrolled here that should be analyzed because a lot of them are going to Hanover, and it's not because the building is ugly; it's because of the education. And um, I think there is a lot that can be gained by focusing on enrollment and the education is what will drive enrollment. And the more enrollment we have, our taxes will go down. Regardless of this bond, the taxes are ridiculous. We need more enrollment. And I really think it's education-based. One of my biggest concerns about the bond is I know it's gonna come out of education in the end, which we can't afford even now. So I hope that I would encourage the board, if they're not already doing it, I hope that you are, to be analyzing every single student that leaves this district and why are they leaving and what can be done here to keep and to get students here, not because the building's pretty, but because we're adding programs and doing a different type of education and doing more of what people are leaving to go to in other places. Um, <clears throat> Jim? I'm going to just lead right back off in the beginning. We do not know what the state of Vermont's going to do. I'm asking you as board members to read and study it and make the decision that the vote should happen after you find out where the state of Vermont is going to go. As far as building, I'm really glad to hear that we're not counting on growing our population because the bond vote in March was all based on we were going to grow our population. And it's quite not, frankly, really nice reading in a newspaper, Ben, that Chillington doesn't know what they're talking about with their own village, that, you know, we know it's going to bring more students. Um, on a third part here, as I remember sitting with Mary Beth Banos, a previous um, superintendent, some seven or eight years ago, and sitting in her office and saying exactly what the state of Vermont is saying today. We need to reach out. We need to be looking at building a building for 1,100 to 1,200 students. And but first, we need to get the state of Vermont to say that we will be the hub. That was a conversation in the superintendent's office seven or eight years ago. And here we are talking about building a building just to, I don't know, like right now I'm being told just to keep what we have today. But then on the other hand, we want to get students from outside to come in. Well, where are they going to go if we just want to keep what we have today? Really, this comes down to, I believe there's 18 board members. I hope 
there is nine or 10 of you that can actually see and understand and trust like your own budget at your own house. You don't gamble on something until you know the game you're playing. And you will not know the game you're playing until after the state makes their decision. So please, at least nine of you to 10 to actually say, I am not gonna gamble with taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Josh. Josh Linton, Cattle, uh, Plymouth. So just looking at a number that was just tossed out there, we were planning on a school for the exact same population that we have now, which are currently school 60,000 square feet. On option 2B, we're planning that on 90,000 square feet. So apples to apples would be 60,000 square feet, which would be 16 million dollars cheaper, just pointing out simple math. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, then Ed. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I see, and there's option one, uh, option two, and option three. What does this S dash S F mean? <laughs> Tell them what you price per square foot. You good? I did. Okay. Right, thanks. Uh, Kelly? So, in this new bill, are we also looking to better our special ed for the more needy of kids? Yes, since the comment was made that only the professors and the high class people voted yes on the new bond, and all of us low lifes voted no. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting that, Kelly. I never saw that written down, nor have I heard that. I think that there are many reasons why people voted yes. And many reasons why people voted no, and I'm not sitting here conjecturing why. Oh yeah, no, so, I mean, I'm fine with that. I think we because I've done my research, and I know there's a lot of people out there that have degrees that voted no. But yeah, the special ed. I had a kid in here that was special ed, and it went to the principal, who was Greg Schiller at the time, because his special ed teacher didn't feel that it was necessary that he get a just a hard saying that he had completed all of grades that's our school board i mean our superintendent so well I, i'd like to think we do the best we can for all students and yeah, I, I know some that have already left here that are special ed and gone to or other schools yeah special ed standards have changed pretty dramatically just in the last 20 years if you i don't know if lee um sherwood is online but you know Pamela, I think this goes to the question that you asked about, you know, what are the new education standards? That's one area where they've changed dramatically and where the new bills would be um, set to address. And one of the concepts is that you need more one-on-one -on -one time with, with kids in special ed programs. And the current building doesn't allow for as much of that as the new bill would. That takes more square feet. Keep me honest here, Sherry. Right. I mean, we've moved special ed classrooms all over this building, but the new bill design really embeds a resource room and a support um, uh, education intervention within each of the pods. So the students aren't traveling, this pod is the bottom, and so is the space. And so when when those special ed kids complete the pod grades, they're going to get a certificate. All students who meet their, their requirements for graduation based on their individual skills and abilities, all we see those in the high school design. And that's that's based on an IET that's made decision. That is not the superintendent's decision. That's no, what no, it is not. And we won't get into that discussion because you're the one who fought Jeffrey getting a this is a comment on the students. No, that, that's fine. I will sit, I will handle it outside. Okay. That's fine. Uh Peggy. Yes, uh that reminds me. I think I read that the teacher student ratio is one to 12. Is that correct? I'm not clear on that. I can't answer that oh, question. Really? No. Well, maybe the super. I mean, I could look back in the report and answer that question. 
Well, isn't that pretty basic information? It's different for every yeah, campus. Every we have it. It's just not like right. at our fingertips. Right. We get a report on that we every month in our in our board book, and um, I don't have it in front of me, but I know that every school has a different ratio based upon the population in the school. So if there are no more new build questions, I think we have had money. Yeah, no Could you please publish pictures in the standard in the Valley or something like that? What the interior of this building is going to look like? There's going to be brick walls, going to be you know, birch walls, going to be sheet rock, gypsum board. Let's, you know, steel studs, wood studs. Let's, you know, carpet on the floor, concrete floors, tile floors. I wish the architect was here to speak to some of that, but definitely it's a combination of gypsum and block walls. Uh, there'll be some interior uh, finishes for, you know, a little more of a hardscape interior uh, finish uh, where, you know, those those interior finishes are, are necessary for, you know, abuse of, of wall re resistance abuse. Uh, it would... Definitely be, you know, a brick structure and um, it's a steel construction um, and, uh, you know, interior walls are built with like gauge metal. Well, and that that's going to depend on what your electrical system is going to be. You got to run the MC cable, um, EMP, Walmart, whatever, you know, and you have no, you have no final cost. <laughs> Maybe you can speak to the cost of the electrical. No, but you have no final cost of a, of a new build or retrofit or anything. Um, we we priced out a number of options. Uh, are you speaking specifically to the new build or renovation or plan A, B, and C or one, two, or three? You have no, you don't have final cost. Right. So we we did our um, most either yes or no. We did our most accurate estimate based off of what was uh, there for the bond vote, which was a DD design development set of documents. So we go in, we take off every stud, every brick, every uh, square foot of roofing, and we put pricing together for it. So that's that's the most accurate pricing that that we've done to date. These options here are looking kind of at a higher level from a rough order of magnitude standpoint. Did you do one with a sloped roof? Yes. Like a metal roof, like a lean roof? Yep, here. sloped roof, flat roof. Um, in in the new build options, option three, there's a mix of both, flat roof and sloped. Do you have a flat roof on your house? I don't, but I also don't have a steel frame house. Yeah. What do you have for roof? I have a pitch roof. Material. I think, I think we're out of time. I think we, you've made your point. Do you want to ask him a personal question of this house? Let's come on. Do it at him. He's the builder. He's an architect. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, Doug, I think you've made your right. point. Yeah. You got it. So, um, Roger. Um, friends, Roger back Huntington. I remember two years ago, last board meeting, I came to the week, and there was a special bond vote for a million dollars to continue the, your study or question assessment article, rather. Uh, for a million dollars to continue your investigation into this new bill. And I was on the board years ago, and I think when you first came on. And I've been hearing about these donors and the amount of donor participation that was going to cover these partners. But in my mind, I've never seen them materialize. What is the total amount that you have pledged? Still three and a half million dollars. Three and a half million off a hundred million dollars. What happened to those 20 and 30 million dollar numbers that were initially reported? I don't recall 20 and 30 million dollar numbers. Right. Well, I remember them hearing that those were what you were expecting, your expected donations. Oh, total yeah. campaign goals? Yeah. Yeah. I think what the district needs, and this is, you're talking to me, so I'll speak for my, I guess, personal opinion here as a board well, member. Handle. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, we really need to recognize that with the kind of volatility that we're all seeing at the state level, that uh, there needs to be more development that happens at the school level. And I think you, there's plenty of good examples around the country, as some people have suggested, looking at other schools, um, public schools that have been able to stand up development offices. That's something that I, you know, if we could get a little wiggle room in our budget, I'd really like to see us invest in. That's long-term thinking. That's like, you know, you've got a 30-year bond. If you've got you know, that much time to start subsidizing some of that, take it off the back of the taxpayers, I think that's effort that's worthwhile. But that's, you're asking me, that's, those are my thoughts. 
And I remember the two who just like to follow up on that. I remember at that meeting there was a woman who was supposed to be coordinating fundraising. a fundraiser who was coordinating an effort with the community and the board. Is that person still active on this yeah. process? Yeah, Marlena McNamee. Yeah, she was extended by the uh, Woodstock Economic Development uh, Commission. I think to about twenty-five thousand dollars, maybe four months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the mo most recent things that Marlena has done is um, Bernie Sanders had a pot of federal money that we put in for an application for the stormwater system part of the bill. That'd be about a million and a half dollars. Burlington High School was able to get that money last year's cycle, and so we're kind of following suit on that. We're waiting to hear back. But those are the kind of things, kind of money that you choose. So the money is still there, but it's still minor compared to the overall cost. Yeah, so two percent maybe. Right, but she's somebody who's you know as a part-time fundraiser. No, no, I'm not, I'm not blaming her. I'm just saying the overall. You no, know, Marlene's efforts. I'm sure, well, doing her job as much as she can. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the overall commitment from the community doesn't seem to have changed much in three or four years. Just a point. If it's quick, Kelly. Yep. What is what's going to happen with the existing concrete if we do a complete rebuild? Where is it going to be hauled to? Where is it going to be dumped? How much is that going to be costing? Yeah. So any. Yeah. yeah go ahead. I'm sorry. Your demo. Right. Yeah. So in, any kind of um, yeah with, with the demolition of the existing buildings, anything that's uh, that can be salvaged, uh, and when I say salvage, means for reuse. So oftentimes concrete's taken away, crushed up, turned into aggregate that can be used for road construction and any number of things. So that would be separated and removed from the site. But things like metal probably will also get separated. Yes, and go 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 to a you know. Well, yeah, you can bury sure. metal. You can bury concrete, but not metal. Yep. Yeah. Most of these landfills like having concrete because they have to. Put a, a layer of, I don't really know the correct term, but it's more of a harder aggregate on each lift of, of waste. Correct. Yeah. Right. I do know that much. Yeah. <laughs> Probably more than I, I can explain. All right, I want to thank everyone. Oh, Bob, did you want to make a comment? I'm going to move to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'll thank everyone first. All right. all right. Thank you all for coming. If you have continuing questions, we uh, solicit. Uh, your opinions and your views. Uh, we're hoping to have in each community some way of uh, speaking to your board members. Um, you should probably be looking through in the standard, the Mountain Times, and the listers if you use those, and also social media. We'll be making those invitations to you. So thank you very much. Thank you to you folks for your questions and the answers. Yes, and yeah, yeah. very helpful to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Here.